Hello everyone and welcome back. Now in the previous video, I derived the heat equation for you. And in particular, what I showed you is that it's kind of a dynamical system, right? It moves in time. So let me show you, let me remind you of the simple form of this equation. Okay, so in this case, this is where most of the quantities are uh, constant. So again, you can really think of this as sort of like an, a uniform rod that we're interested in here. I'm just going to call this Q. I know I called it Q tilde, but it doesn't really matter what you call it. It's just some sort of external heat source. Remember, U is the temperature. Uh, K is the thermal diffusivity. It essentially, it just tells you sort of how fast things spread through this medium. And so what I told you on the previous video was that you have to know how things get started. You have to know the initial temperature distribution across the rod, right? That makes sense. But I also said that you have to be careful about what happens at the boundaries, right? Does heat just fly off the ends of the rod and heat up the whole room? Or is there some sort of care taken uh, that maybe you have fixed values or you're, you're sort of heating the uh, ends of the rods to a specific temperature. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about these sort of boundary conditions. This is what really makes partial differential equations much different and much more complicated than dynamical systems or differential, ordinary differential equations. Now here's how I want to think of this though. Here is my rod. Let's say here's x equal to zero. And here's x equal to L. I'm going to take a, a sort of perspective on this as looking at this thing all the way through time, right? So maybe what I can do is if my rod is extended in the vertical direction, I can imagine this, this rod sort of flowing through time. And sometimes, you know, people do this to think about like four dimensional space, right? The movement of a human through time. If you've ever read Kurt Vonnegut's, uh, Slaughterhouse Five. He describes the aliens as seeing past, present, and future all at the same time, and and you know people look like these massive centipedes almost with all of their their past and present in front and behind them. That's how I want to take a perspective on this as well. Here's my rod, and I want to extend it in time. Right. So. Every time I take a slice here, it might be the state of the rod at that specific time, right? So at time equal to zero, I have this initialization of the rod. So u of x comma zero is equal to f of x. So this is really how I like to think about partial differential equations, right? It's an object being swept through time. In this case, it's a one dimensional you know, medium being swept through time. So then the question is, you know, if, you, if I just kind of look at my box that I've created, because time is unbounded here, this is an unbounded rectangle, but I've defined what happens on one boundary of the box, I need to think about what happens on the other two. So let's look at one possibility, okay? One possibility here, out of potentially infinitely many, is what's called a prescribed temperature. So prescribed temperature. And this is basically what it sounds like. It's the temperature at one end of the rod is fixed. So for example, um, at x equal to zero or at x equal to L, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to use x equal to zero as my example here. Uh, we have u of 0 comma t. So this has to be prescribed for all time. That is this boundary right here. u of 0 comma t. And this would be prescribed by some function in time. Okay. So essentially what's happening here is that, you know, my laboratory setting for my rod being heated here, I have control over what happens at the left endpoint. And in particular, I am heating it or cooling it sufficiently to keep it at some temperature that I choose, okay? And this temperature could change in time, right? But the fact of the matter here is that the end point of the rod has a prescribed temperature. You can do the same thing on the left-hand side as well. And there's a particular example or a particular version of this 
uh, that we're going to see a lot, and that is when u of 0 comma t is equal to 0, okay? So when this thing is just a constant value at 0, this is what's called Dirichlet, Dirichlet boundary condition, okay? So if you are fixing one of the endpoints to a single constant value of 0. Now, notice here, I haven't given you any units, right, for the temperature. This could be 0 Kelvin. This could be zero Celsius, this could be zero Fahrenheit, or this could be zero of any other measure of temperature uh, that I describe, right? So the fact that this is equal to zero doesn't really matter. It could be equal to 100 in a different unit. Uh, so mathematically, we just choose zero. But whenever a boundary condition is fixed at zero, we call it a Dirichlet boundary condition. Okay, so that's obviously not the only kind of boundary condition that we could have, though. We can also have another boundary condition called an insulated, insulated boundary condition. So I'm gonna, I use BC for boundary condition and I use IC for initial condition. You'll get used to it as we go through. But in this case, you prescribe, so prescribe, sorry. The heat flux or the heat flow, right? Either one, flux or flow, instead of the temperature. Okay, so in the prescribed temperature one, I was saying, you know, the left end of the rod has to have this temperature all the time. Whereas in an insulated boundary condition, the temperature could vary on the left end, but essentially I'm saying how much I can lose or gain, right? So for this would take the temperature, uh, uh, take the, um, it would take the form of, okay, so negative K naught of zero, remember, so this was a coefficient that came up when we were talking about the correspondence between flux and temperature, uh, times the partial derivative of U with respect to X at zero comma T. So again, I'm just using the X equal to zero uh, endpoint here and it's equal to some prescribed flux, right? So for example here, I'm pumping in, uh, you know, I'm, some sort of energy is being pushed in here and flowing into the rod. And a lot of time we'll call these things insulated or, or perfectly insulated or a Neumann boundary condition. A Neumann boundary condition is when the heat flux is zero, okay? So when there's no movement over the boundary. So this would be just when the partial derivative at the endpoint is equal to zero. So similarly, Dirichlet is when you fix the temperature at the endpoint to be zero. Neumann is when you fix the flux at the endpoint to be zero. Now, the way that I like to think about Neumann boundary conditions is actually like a big pool sort of thing, right? So you have water splashing around and, and so, you know, if it's a really turbulent little pool that you've got here, maybe if U represents the height of, you know, each sort of tide or each, um, you know, each splash at each point of space and time, essentially this is the edge of your pool. It says you're not losing anything over the boundary here, right? Nobody's flowing out. You know, you're never splashing water over the edge. You're always sort of coming up against this wall and you kind of get refracted backwards, okay? That's what this is saying here as well. Essentially, as a boundary condition for the heat equation, it's saying that nothing is being lost off the left-hand side here, right? So everything that hits it basically turns around and gets pushed back. So that's two different kinds of boundary conditions. There is one more that we will consider. Now, you can always come up with much more complicated boundary conditions, and it would sort of depend on the this specific setting that you might be interested in. So again, for us, we're just going to look at three different boundary conditions in, unless we sort of encounter uh, a unique application that necessitates a much more complicated one. But these are the three sort of most common, uh, not just for the heat equation, but for a lot of partial differential equations. So... Here's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at uh, Newton's law of cooling, okay? So the rod, it could be in contact, 
be in contact um, at the boundary. So let's say at x equal to zero or x equal to L with a moving fluid. Now, moving fluid, usually this, the example of this uh, would be air, right? You know, if the rod is just sort of hanging out, it's, you know, there's, there's some sort of influence potentially from the external air temperature, right? So if my, hot, my, my rod is, you know, piping hot, you think of this coming out of like a, you know, like a, a, a steel mill or something like that. Uh, you have this big, huge, red hot rod of metal. It comes in contact with cooler air, right? So you're sort of losing heat potentially at the boundaries because you're coming in contact with a moving fluid, air. Right? So, um, in this case, the heat flow of the rod at the boundaries is proportional to the difference between the rod and the external temperature, okay? So again, this is sort of a, new, uh, a Fourier's law, you know, you kind of want things to balance out, okay? So in this case, you get your heat flux, so how you're going to change at the boundaries so here, again, I'm just using the x equal to zero boundary again. This is proportional. I'm going to use this capital H just as a constant here. This is called the heat transfer coefficient. That's why I used capital H for heat. Um, of u of zero comma t minus uh, whatever the maybe external temperature is. Okay, let's, let's actually read this. You know, let's ignore maybe some of the constants here. But for a second, it says that the heat flux is going to be proportional to the difference between your temperature on the rod at the boundary and the external temperature at the boundary, okay? Now, first of all, let's look at a, a condition here, right? So, one, if this thing... So if my rod is hotter than the air, then this implies essentially that this is negative, right? Now you might have to remind yourself in the previous video what the flux means, but essentially this means that you're sort of decreasing the temperature of the air, right? So you're sort of losing uh, you're losing heat to the boundary here. So essentially the air is cooling you off, right? Your temperature is going down. So of course you can do this the other way around, right? You could say that if you, if the temperature of your rod is less than the temperature of the air, well then this means that you're, you're being heated up by the air, right? So sort of heat is coming in from the air, right? Maybe it's a, you know, you've got a, a really cold rod, for example, but you've got a really, really hot room. Maybe there's a furnace, furnace in the room or something like that. You know, you leave it for a long enough time and, you know, that hot air is going to start heating up your rod. And of course, you know, we're making a lot of technical uh, and simplifying assumptions here that, you know, this can only happen on the boundaries. Of course, this can happen inside as well, but that's co covered by this function Q. Right? So I want you to sort of keep this in mind. Really what, what, what we're doing right now is looking at uh, what can happen on the boundaries here and how you can kind of close up this system. And the reason I'm interested in this all goes back to my little rectangle here, right? So I really care about describing the three sides of my rectangle. The first one is called my initial conditions. That's my initial heat distribution. And these ones that go for all time but are fixed in space, these are the boundary conditions. And so I've given you an example of three of them, really the Newton's law of cooling, this is probably the most realistic one. It's the one that you would encounter the most and it's sort of the most complicated one because it combines both of them. Sometimes we call this uh, a Robert boundary conditions as well, which we'll sort of start seeing a little bit more whenever we get into sturm liouville theory. Uh, but for the most part, we're gonna work with Dirichlet and Neumann. Uh, in some sense, because this Newton's really sort of generalizes both of these. So it's better to understand the sort of simplifying cases first and then move up to the more complicated uh, situations. So in the next video, I'm going to go into the actual heat equation and look at some solutions.
And just like we did with dynamical systems, we're going to focus on fixed points, equilibrium solutions, okay? So in this case, an equilibrium solution is when you set the time derivative equal to zero. Still have a derivative in space. So things aren't necessarily as easy, but they're certainly more fun. So I'll see you all in the next video, everyone.